Amen. So we left off la last week. We left off last week talking about lust and temptation and uh, Jesus being led in the uh, willingness to be tempted of God, to be tempted of Satan. And that's one thing we want to do tonight to assure us and let us know that God does not tempt any man. So when he is tempted, he is led of his own lust, of his own lust, and of his own pride. So tonight we would like to do a recap and just briefly talk about uh, temptations and, and lust. Now, the Bible says if we go to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and the third verse, we will find these words. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But, but Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. So as we briefly talk about uh, temptation and briefly talk about uh, the first four verses of the sixth chapter of Matthew, we will find that Jesus was talking about almsgiving and he was talking about prayer. And he says there is a right way to give. There's a right way to pray. And what we found is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees would stand up in the marketplace or in places where people were around just to be seen of men that they may receive arms, that they re may receive praise and to be seen of me to say that they were so holy for people to believe I'm so righteous. Now the old manuscripts dealt strictly with righteousness. It did not break it down into almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. So the question tonight is, what is alms giving? What is prayer? What is fasting? What are works of righteousness? Sister Power and, and those who are owned by conference call and those who are owned by Facebook, Live. The question is if prayer and fasting and the giving of alms are works of righteousness, what are what are some things that are works of unrighteousness? Well, uh, if you do things for men to uh, give you praise mm -hmm. and that what you're doing is not praising God when you uh, do good mm -hmm. for me, and that's, that's unrighteousness. Okay, that's unrighteousness. Okay. Any others? If faith <laughs> and love, <laughs> if faith and love uh -huh. and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you are works of righteousness. Shouldn't we pursue yes, that which is works of righteousness? Or should we pursue that 
which is unrighteous. Now the Bible, uh, that the Bible has us to know that the way we know whether we're doing works of righteousness or works of unrighteousness is by who we are following, Satan or God. And there's a big, and there's a big difference between the righteousness of, that is of God and the unrighteousness which is of the world and which is of Satan. So tonight, when we look at temptation going back to that fourth chapter of uh, Matthew, what we find here is that our times of testing, which is temptation, shows that Jesus really was the Son of God. And he was able to overcome Satan's and his temptation. A person has not shown true obedience if he has never had an opportunity to disobey. So what that's saying? In life we will receive temptations, situations, and circumstances which will put us in a position to either obey or disobey God. And, and his own son was put in the position by the temptations in the wilderness to either obey or disobey. And we know from the record that Jesus obeyed him. So it is never God who tempts us. And we go to the book of James, it tells us that God does not tempt any man. When we are tempted, we are led away of our own lust. Yes. And these Jesus experienced these same lusts as you and I do today. So, but the difference is Jesus humbled himself and proved himself. Satan is the devil. He tempted Eve in the garden and he's going to keep tempting you and I. Here, he tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Now, Satan... Some folks say Satan is not real. Some say God is not real. And if you li listen to the late President Ronald Reagan's son, who does this commercial and says, I'm a lifelong atheist. And he says, I'm not afraid of burning in hell. And I'm here tonight to tell you that there is a hell and Satan is real. And God is real. So, so, so what we have here is that Satan is a fallen angel. He is real. He's not symbolic. He's not a figure of our imagination. And he's fighting constantly against those who will follow and obey God. And prayerfully, all of us are doing the best we can with God's help, with Jesus' help, and with the Holy Spirit to obey. So it goes on here to say that Jesus will one day ring over his creation, but Satan tried to force his hand and get him to declare his kingship prematurely. And many of us, God has purpose and will things in our lives and we get distracted by the forces of people or things in the world. And, it, and Satan's sole purpose was to trip Jesus up 
And you know, so many times uh, we are influenced by our circumstances, our situations, and people who are close to us. And Satan will use every opportunity to influence us to keep us from doing the will and the purpose of God. So we encourage everyone uh, tonight to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. Desire the filling of the Holy Spirit so we'll have some help to fight off the lust and the temptation that so easily beset us. And if Jesus had given in, his mission on earth would have been avoided. He wouldn't have accomplished what he came to do. He said, for this cause, I came into the world to die for man. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. I came to save my people from their sin. If he had a vow to Satan, his mission, his purpose in life. And God knows the plan and the purpose that he has for each and every one of us. And I would encourage everyone to ask God, what is my purpose? in life and what are the plans that you have for me it may not be a preacher it may you may you may be an encourager you may be a prayer warrior you may be a, a servant who doesn't have to wait for people to ask you to do that which is right you just go ahead, you know it needs to be done, and you get it done. So as we go on, we will find that Jesus was tempted by Satan, but he never sinned. Although we may feel dirty after being tempted, we should remember that temptation itself is not a sin. When we sin, when we give in, and disobey. Does that make sense? Yes. When we carry it out. Now Jesus went on further to say that a lot of things that we do take place in the heart. And we commit them in the heart. So we get so concerned about pointing fingers at people and saying, well, you did this and you did that and I've never done that. But God who sees the heart, he searches the heart of me. So be careful when we uh, 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 point the finger at people because we have faults of our own and we are here to encourage each other and lift each other up when we fall. And so in order to do that, Satan is an accuser of the brother. A saint or a believer in Christ should never be an accuser. We should be a helper. Just as God is our sustainer and our protector, we should do likewise toward one another. So as we go on here, we find that Satan temptation focus on three critical areas that we talked about earlier. Our physical desires, possession and power, and pride. So as we go to the sixth chapter of Matthews, beginning at the fifth verse, he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, 
they have their reward. As children of God, as believers, as, as born again Christians, our job in works of righteousness is to pray, is to give alms, is to fast. And the Bible says some things takes fasting, prayer and fasting to receive. So we would say from reading down here, Jesus is saying, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a pretender. Don't stand out in the, on the, in the street corner. Don't stand there to be seen of me. And this is what this whole discourse uh, boils down to is that we we don't do things to be seen of me. So going forward, we find here that but thou in the sixth verse when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which seeth in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus here is not uh, speaking against public prayer. We ought to have a private prayer life that manifests itself before we have a public uh, prayer life. So Jesus here is saying some leaders in biblical times, especially the leaders, wanted to be seen as being so holy. And public prayer was one way that they used to get attention. Jesus saw through their self-righteous acts. However, and taught the essence of prayer is not public style, but it's private communication with God. Prayer is a private communication with God, even though we may do it in public. There is a place for public prayer, but to pray only where others will notice us is not an indication of, of how real we are. That your real audience is not God. It's not God. It's a me. It's to be seen. So when we pray, he says, but when you pray, in the seventh verse, but when ye pray, you use not vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, but... For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before we even ask. And so the Pharisees used to stand out in the street corner and they would repeat the same words over and over and over. And we were told, told not to babble. And Babel is just uh, repeating, saying things. So they were out in the public just to be seen of men. So Jesus said, when you pray, pray to the Father, which seeth in secret, and he who seeth in secret will reward ye openly. It's not about having prestige or reputation that because when people see you, uh, they there come 
uh, uh, Holy John. There is righteous James. Jesus said, if we pray or give our gifts or give our tithes and our offerings to, for it to be spoken of by men, to be seen of men, that they will praise us, he's saying we have our reward. And there's no reason to look for a reward in heaven because we have gotten our reward because we want it to be thought of as somebody uh, with me. So here he says in the eighth, but be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before we even ask. And the disciples, when we get, a lot of people say the, the, the model prayer is the Lord's prayer. It is not the Lord's prayer. It is a model prayer because the disciples asked Jesus a question. So Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so beginning at the ninth verse, Jesus gives an example of, of how we should pray some ingredients that go into our prayer. And he says, in this manner, or in this style, on this accord, pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. So what are, what are, what are we saying? We are saying here, uh, what what are we doing when we say hallowed be thy name? The phrase our well, what we're doing? Yes. What are we doing? We are honoring God. Okay. Uh, what's another name for God? What what does Jesus say for us to do? He doesn't say say our God. He says. Our Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, indicates that God is not only a majestic, is not only majestic and holy, but he is also personal and loving. The first line in this model prayer is a statement of praise and a commitment to honor God, holy name. So it's, it's, we are honoring his name. It's a commitment to do that. And it's a statement of praise. Our Father, which art in heaven. It says we can honor God's name by being careful to use it respectfully. If we use God's name lightly, we aren't remembering God's holiness. So a lot of times, you know, we we may say things in in jest. We may say it with our lips, but it's not in our heart. We just saying something to be saying something. So we aren't truly, you know, that's the thing to say. That's that's the line to uh you. That's that's the religious tradition that we are uh, naming and claiming. But everything we do as it relates to God should come from our heart, should be a part of every fiber of our being. So he says here that we, we are showing praise and honor to God for who our Father, for who he is. Then as he says in the 10th, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So this 10th verse says, thy kingdom come. It's reference to 
God's spiritual reign. Now, the, the Jews got it mixed up because they were under the Roman Empire when Jesus was born. So they had the antis anticipation when Jesus, Jesus and John said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They felt like that Jesus was this king that was coming to overthrow the Roman Empire. But when when but but the Father and the Son have a kingdom which has its own purpose, its own plans, and its own agenda. And God's purpose and plan was not man's plan. And so when we get it twisted, we go to expecting that God should do this and do that. And with the pandemic that's uh, causing so much uh, damage, danger, death, we ask the question, where is God? God is here. But because of sin, things happen in the world. It's not that God uh, desires that as many young males are being killed, many young females are being killed. It's not God's desire or wish. I wish I could tell you that God is chastising or he's the originator of the coronavirus. Or it may be that God is using, is allowing Satan to do uh, his evil work because the Bible says that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus, God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I came that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. So, whatever God's purpose is in this situation, God's going to get the glory. You remember Joseph, his brother, sold him into slavery. He ended up in a pit. He ended up in prison. And he ended up in the palace of Egypt. So what we have here, Joseph told his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. And so all of the evil and our young people being cut down before they can even live at a young age. That's the work of Satan. So in this pandemic situation, we still have to look to God who's the author and finisher of our faith. And getting back to the lesson here, when it says, thou kingdom come, is a reference to God's spiritual kingdom. Not, he didn't come to free Israel from Rome. God's kingdom was announced to his covenant people, the Jews. In Abra in, uh, with Abraham. We can go to Luke 13 and 28. God's kingdom is present in Jesus' ring in the believer's heart. The kingdom of God is present right now in every believer's heart right now. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Everybody who confesses with their mouth what they believe. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You are a believer. You are a follower. So... God's kingdom is already present because it's in us. He has established his presence, his kingdom within us. We are the temple of God. 
Our bodies is the temple of God. He doesn't dwell in them bricks and them two by fours and that plaster. He dwells in us. So, God in this model prayer, Jesus is explaining it. He's personal and he's loving. And thou kingdom come, it will only be completed. God, God's kingdom will only be completed when sin and evil has totally been destroyed. And if you have time, go into Revelation 21 and start at verse 1. When that new heaven and new earth comes. So then Jesus says, when we pray, thou will be done. What are we saying? Thou will be done. When we are saying, thou will be done. When we, when we pray and use these words, what, what are we saying? Thou will be done. Okay. Okay. Are we giving? Uh, are we giving up our fate or will? Yes, for God's will. God's will. Okay. Oh, thy will be done. Any other? Any other comment? When we say, thy will be done, thy will be done. Okay. We are simply saying that we are not resigning to fate. Ourselves to fate. You know how we, uh, I'm lucky. It was just fate that it happened, you know. Uh, as they say, if the rabbit was so lucky, how did he lose his foot? If he was so lucky, bruh, bruh Hall. So, so, you know, though, those are things we say, but what's the correlation between you having a rabbit foot in your pocket? Or, or, or in your shirt pocket and you say well you know this happened because I had uh, this rabbit foot for a believer it's not the rabbit like on Easter it's not about the bunny rabbit it's about Jesus the bunny rabbit and Easter is pagan is idol worship so what we are saying when we say thou will be done we are praying that god's purpose perfect purpose will be accomplished in the world as well as in the next does that make sense because because yeah. we say it because we said thou will be done in earth as it is in heaven right yes. so we right. Mm -hmm. we want his will to be done in the earth as well so in the 11th verse it says any other comments in the 11th verse it uh it says give us this day our daily bread bread our daily bread now is that physical or that spiritual it, it just it, it's okay it, it someone says it's 
is is uh is is both someone says is spiritual. That uh give us this day our daily bread. Is that spiritual or is that physical? Okay. It's both. Uh prayerfully everybody uh woke up this morning and you did eat physical food and you did read a scripture or pray to the father and he spoke to you so you is we want to receive both physical as well as spiritual food because what did jesus tell satan satan knew he was hungry and he wanted jesus to use his power to turn a stone into bread into bread but 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 what did jesus say it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the father which is spiritual which is both which is both and and so we need both to make it in this world the physical body craves uh the natural foods that we eat and it it, it craves certain medicines that we may need when we get sick but the spiritual food is both able to heal us physically meet our needs physically as well as help me out fill in the blank the spiritual food is, is able to uh uh meet our needs both physically and spiritually because we we have a spirit and the spirit communicates with the spirit the flesh is not what communicates with god and when we go in prayer in uh in jesus name to the father we go in spirit for the bible says what for god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in what spirit and in truth truth so it's our spiritual man that needs to be fed the spiritual food and then on another occasion the scripture tells us don't fear man but fear god who can destroy both soul body and spirit so so as we go on he says thou uh, give us this day our daily bread so we are saying lord when we wake up each morning after he has sustained us and kept us uh, from hurt harm and danger when we wake up in the morning we're saying give us what we need physically and spiritually to make it through this day give us thanking you for the opportunities and possibilities to do your will and to be a better person than I was yesterday. Help me to forget what I did wrong yesterday and make this day a better day. There's nothing we can do about yesterday but we can do everything we can that's pleasing and uplifting and that's a sweet savior to Jesus Christ our Lord today. We can't do nothing about yesterday but God can. And so we uh, each day will take care of itself. So as we go forward what we will find here is in verse 11 that that god is the sustainer and provider i know uh i have a few we most of us have a few dollars in our pocket a few dollars in the bank 
we have a job. We we have a, a family and friends. We have credit that you know if we need to draw on. Um, that we 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 easily say that I did this or I'm going to do this. But who is the source of all things? Who is the source? God the Father is the source. And the Bible says the earth is his and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. So who, 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 do, what, who, does, who owns everything? God owns everything. We're just stewards over it. And when we leave here, we're going to leave all of it behind. Now, somebody might have the idea that I'm going to have the brink truck. I'm going to have a Swanner van line uh, line up in the funeral procession. And I'm going to take everything with me. But what good is it going to do the flesh? Because the flesh... The flesh is going back to the dust from which it came. And nothing cardinal, right. nothing cardinal oh, okay. or temporary okay. or these things on the earth will be in a, a value in heaven. And I pray that we don't end up in that other place because the Bible says it's weeping and gashing. It's a, a lake of fire where the soul right. is never comforted. You you own fire and 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 never the fire never goes out. So it says here that rem, always remember be 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 mindful when you said talking about what you did. If if the Lord didn't wake us up this morning, if the Lord didn't give us that bread, if the Lord didn't give us that job. If the Lord didn't give us raiments to put on, we are stewards of what he gives and what he provides. So we are saying God is our sustainer and provider. It is a misconception. It, that's the point I'm trying to get. It's a misconception for us to think that we provide for our needs ourselves. God put everything in place. We must trust God daily to provide what we know we need. Now, we talking about our needs. We're not talking about our wants and our desires. We're talking about our wants. That's right. And it, and it says here in the 12th verse, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors now what is what is that saying now debts we are in no. we are in debt to God the Father yep. for the price that Jesus paid on Calvary he, right. he redeemed us and one of the things yeah. he said on the cross he said Father forgive them for they know not what they do he said forgive them for the nail for the slap for being whipped till he was unrecognizable he said father forgive them and so what what this is saying is we're asking God to forgive us of our sins and our trespasses mm -hmm. and the things that we do right. as we forgive our debtors as God has forgiven us we ought to forgive one another and 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 this 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 is not saying that well well God you know you you uh just forgive me but I can't forgive uh, so and so for what they did to me. 
Now, it's not, it's not predicated, it's not a tit for tat. Well, it's not saying that God's going to forgive uh, me just because I say I forgive you. God, it can't be manipulated. A lot of times I'll say that, but what's the other word we say? I forgive you, but I, I won't what? what we, I won't forget it. And, and then the flesh, the flesh has the tendency that every time we see something, see someone that may have wronged us, somehow it'll come back up. It'll come back to our remembrance. And we, we saying we done forgot about it. Uh, we saying we done forgiven the person. And, but we haven't forgot about it. We rehearse it or go through it all over again. And so, this, so, so we're asking to God to forgive us of our sin. He did that on the cross knowing that you and I would sin. He said, forgive us. For Lord, Father, forgive them. I know they're going to mess up. I know they're going to come back and try to re-crucify me. So, as we forgive our debtors, we should forgive because God has forgiven us. And it says, and lead us not into temptation, the 13th, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, listen at this. Jesus is not implying that God leads us into temptation. He's simply asking for deliverance for deliverance from Satan and his deceit. All of us as Christians struggle with temptation. Sometimes it is so subtle that we don't even realize what's happening to us. We don't realize what's happening to us. But God has promised that he won't allow us to be tempted beyond our endurance. Uh, Minister Herbert, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. First Corinthians ten and thirteen. And and uh I'll read it I'll read it for you. It says there have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So what is, what is this saying? In our culture, which is filled with uh, uh, sin and evil and all type of immoral uh, things, it is saying that, and pressure, Paul here encourages the uh, Corinthians, and he's encouraging us today about temptation. He's, what Number one, he says, wrong desires and temptations happen to everyone. So don't feel you have been single out. He's saying others have resisted temptation, so we can also. Any temptation can be resisted because God will help us to resist it. God helps temptation. us to resist temptation. You can resist because God will help you to resist it. Amen. So recognizing that God will help us, and this is the why we have to acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior. Because we have some help. 
but to the, 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 the sinner, the man or woman who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord. He's just going off of the influence of Satan and off of the, the flesh. So there, there is not the proper and correct help to resist temptation. So, so Paul recognized that people and situations are going to give us trouble. And he's saying run from anything that we know is wrong. Choose to do only that which is right. Pray to God for help. And seek friends who love God and can offer us help when we are tempted. I, I saw in the paper a young man that had just met a friend. They had went to Florida and something uh, terribly went wrong that one shot the other one. And now there's a, two families that are grieving and the one that shot the other one claims that he shot him in self-defense because he was trying to rob him. Now, if there are no other witness, the only witness is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's going to come up again. And sometimes we can be friends with the wrong people. And this tragedy has happened. So many days I, our parents tell us, you know, I, it's something about so-and-so. But with us, oh, you know, we li I, I like him or I like her. And we continue to uh, hang around with uh, our associates or our friends. But we, we are seeing too often that friends and family members are killing each other or hurting each other. So, so when our parents or other figures of authority tell us that it may not be good for you to be hanging with so-and-so, check it out. And most of the time, that mother wit is something about mother. It's something about the instinct and the blessing and the anointing that, that God has given mother when they tell us something, or even father. Yeah. And it comes, it comes true. And, and, and so it says, seek friends who can help us, not tear us down, not going to take us to places that we're going to end up regretting we did something. Now, let me ask this question, and we're going to close. Now, is is going to a party a sin? No. No. Is, okay. No. Is uh, eating a sin? No. no. Is drinking a sin? Doing too much. Okay. Okay. So, so is 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 money a sin? No, no. The love of the money. Okay. Is the love of the money? Yeah. Okay. So, money can be a temptation. Going to a party can be a temptation. 99% of the things that we are confronted with in and of themselves, they are not seen. It's not a sin to have a money. It's not a sin to have money. But it's the love of it. Because it, it's going to allow us to uh, become corrupt and uh, to uh, misuse it misused people uh, uh, we may develop uh, we may start selling drugs 
a lot of things. So going to a party in of it in and of itself is not a sin. But there are habits or things that we can start to do that's not pleasing or make being at the party um not a good thing if 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 we're going to start doing as the world do and 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 all of us know you go to places you went there with the intention of doing right but because of the influence of where you were the party the money uh uh it's nothing it's nothing wrong with the money but if you're going to steal from it for it that's what makes it wrong now is being hungry a sin No. Well, what well what be, what can become a sin as it relates to food? When you gluttony, gluttony. Oh, okay, gluttony. What it's else? Too much. Okay, what else? If I steal food, is that the sin? If I steal yeah. food, if I break in, yeah. I rob. So there, the the things that tempt us in and of themselves are not uh, the sin. It's the action. It's our motive. It's our attitude. And it's our intention. So uh, here, here in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 number 4 says pray for God's help. And running from a temptation is the first step in victory. Now, a lot of us don't like to run. I ain't running. Let us go to to uh, let us go to Second Timothy two and twenty two. Second Timothy two and twenty two, and it reads. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call the Lord out of a pure heart. So what this says here is, flee if, if the temptation is so great. It's best for me to lead the party. Uh, I went into Home Depot the other day, and I had, uh, I bought several items, and the highest item on the list, which was about forty some dollars, uh, I didn't scan the item. The sales lady looked. I noticed she looked going through the self-checkout and all the way out i kept looking at the receipt and the receipt should have been more than 27 dollars and i kept looking i was out of the store so the flesh the easiest thing would be going to your car you don't got out of the store with it <laughs> And, I, I, and and I'm not and I'm not what I'm finna say now I'm not saying I have I have in all situations did what I'm finna say sometimes I have went on put it in the car uh, well that's their loss in my game but I was led to go back into the store and tell them that it didn't scan so i went to go in the door and the lady said well you going you need to get in the return line i said i just need so i had to i was about four or five uh persons uh uh in the waiting line and uh when i got up there i said this didn't scan i need to pay for it 
so it came to 40 some dollars. So, that was a temptation to okay. just go on put it. And I'm talking uh, uh, less than uh, two weeks ago, this happened. So, so that was a situation. And I'm not patting myself on the back because if we, if we do a laundry list, uh, 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 this, this doesn't happen always. And I'm sure uh, when you are tempted, sometimes uh, you have passed the test, you disobey. So they rung it up. The bells and whistles didn't go off that uh, we got a, 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 what they call you when you walk out the store and don't pay for it, uh, 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 a theft in progress. Thanks be to God that that didn't happen. So trying to explain why did you go outside and didn't pay for it? And you have it on your receipt. So what? Uh, uh, things in and of itself are not sinful. It's how we. It's how we handle. It. And so, so uh, Daffy Duck used to say, he said, "I'm a greedy little duck, and I'm a scary duck." And then there was a saying. He who runs today lives to fight another day. And in so many instances, these arguments that have flared up, possibly some people who are now uh, in the hospital or in the cemetery may be here if they had have just walked away from the situation. Now, some people you walk away from the situation uh, you can only control your emotions and your feelings. You, uh, you, you, you ain't respond. You're not responsible for them. So some of them still, uh, after you throw up your hands and say, "Okay, you know," they still go ahead and and do bodily damage. But from our he from from our reading tonight, and uh, from Matthew six. Hopefully we have a better understanding uh, and, and always remember this is the model. This is the model prayer. This is not the Lord's prayer. Uh, he's teaching. He's teaching. And uh, so he says here in the 14th verse, for if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now the 12th says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. 14 says, for if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Jesus is warning about forgiveness. If we refuse to forgive others, God will also refuse to give, forgive us. Why? Because we don't, because when we don't forgive others, we are denying our common ground as sinners in need of God's forgiveness. We are all sinners saved by grace. It ain't no big sinner. It ain't no little sinner. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. So we, we got our degrees and levels of sin. Sin is just sin. It's missing the mark. Unfaithful is unfaithful. I don't care if you add uh, fornication or adultery on it. It's unfaithfulness. And because you stole some, and you say someone committed adultery, they both sin. They both sin. So, so, so Jesus here is saying that because we are all sinners, we all on the same level. We all dust. And when 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 the spirit leaves the body, the body is going back to the dust. And uh, so, 
God's forgiveness of sin is not the direct, direct result of our forgiving others, but it is based on our realizing what forgiveness means. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. We can cause the Holy Spirit to be sorry by the way we live. This is Christ's law of forgiveness as taught in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. We all so see it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. God does not forgive us because we forgive others. Remember that. But out of his great mercies, as we come to understand his mercies, However, we will want to be like him. He forgives us, so we forgive one another. Does that make sense? Yes. And after having received forgiveness, we will pass it on to each other. Those who are unwilling to forgive have not become one in Christ, who was willing to forgive even those who crucified him. Are there any questions? We're going to stop uh, right there. Are there any questions? We think uh, we have several on uh, our Facebook live page. We thank y'all for uh, tuning in. We thank everyone that's on uh, the conference call.